say that journey just um, you know became better and better as it went through. So, so as you all know, like during your bachelor's, you have to take a lot of classes, and well, I always hated going to class. And I, I never learned much going to classes anyway. Uh, so I learned most of the things by, uh, you know, reading books or by reading research papers. Uh, so it was kind of a torture for me. Uh, <laughs> really? <laughs> oh. Yeah, and there were classes from 8 o'clock to 5 p.m. And uh, then there were back to black classes and that was quite I think strenuous and then only time I could uh, spend on research was after coming back from classes and um, so that was very little time that you could devote and but after basically the bachelor's uh, the number of classes went down drastically so I could put um, more time on research more time on doing really things that I really like so I think uh, that was very good. And there were, I mean, there were exams during master's also. I had to take some classes, but not as many as uh, okay. you know, that I had to do during my bachelor's. Uh, so that that was very good. And I could also, like, uh, spend most of my time in thinking about and uh, thinking about problems and deciding on projects that I wanted to do. There was a lot of independence that I had uh, during my uh, PhD uh, and also as a postdoctoral researcher. Uh, so I started a uh, research early uh, during my second year of my uh, bachelor's that I started research. At that time, uh, basically what I had to do was uh, read different research papers and figure out what kind of problems were there in literature. Uh, so it was kind of very uh, independent uh, research, uh, which was, I think, helpful because when you are, even when you are doing uh, your PhD or master's, you have to kind of have this attitude of finding your own niche of research. If you depend too much of your on your advisors, I mean, advisors will probably help you uh, define a problem, but it's also good for a researcher to find their areas of interest and follow those on. So, uh, yeah, so that was kind of, uh, uh, yeah, that's, that was kind of a transition, I would say, from bachelor's to PhD, that less classes, you could put more time on research. You could okay. sleep more. <laughs> <laughs> Because, yeah. yeah, I mean, I remember during my bachelor's, yeah, I was, I used to stay awake till like 3 or 4 a.m. and oh. then just get three hours of sleep because you have to then go to classes. Really? Uh, Only eight. three hours? Yeah, oh. except for weekends, that's how much I used to sleep. So, but oh. after, you know, after that, um, I mean, none of the classes were at 8 a.m. I just, they were not there every day. Uh, so even if I am in the lab till late at night, I can sleep in the morning. And uh, so life, I would say, became easier. And it was much more fun because you are doing something which uh, you really like to do. Uh, so that was basically my PhD work was also related to nanoelectronics. Yes. Mm -hmm. It was related to electrical engineering, which I did during my bachelor's. And then I did a drastic shift uh, for my postdoctoral research. I went to biology after that. Uh, oh. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so you, yeah. You, so you are from uh, electrical engineering background and you shifted to biology. So how you handle this uh, journey from uh, engineer to biology as a neuroscientist? Yes. <laughs> Truly speaking, I hated biology. <laughs> but, oh, I should biology during my higher secondary like high school 11th and 10th 12th standard so most people would encourage you to take biology because then you can sit for like engineering exam mm -hmm. as well as medical exams but yes. I'm pretty sure that I don't want to go into that medical line because there was a lot of things you have to remember uh, in biology which I did not like yeah. 
But uh, during my PhD, I will did some biosensor related work, basically the devices that I was developing for low power computation. Yes. I realized that we also used for uh, biosensing applications. So that got me interested in biology. And also since I was working on uh, low power electronic devices, I realized that brain is kind of the lowest power computer. Yes. So that got me interested in the brain. Uh, so I decided to shift. Yeah, the shift is not easy, specifically if you do such a steep transition. So the, for the first year, there was a lot of learning. So the learning yeah. curve is, uh, you don't really understand the jargons that your lab mates use in the new lab. So there is a lot of learning that you have to do, almost like a bachelor student, you have to uh, start from the beginning. So I was taking like courses, which like starting from like undergrad <laughs> to graduate. <laughs> for the first year and also it was the last year of my PhD. So there is a lot of learning, but it's also a lot of fun when you diversify and go to a new field. And yes. the idea is you can combine these two fields together. You can be that unique person, you know, that you know these two fields very well. So um, something very unique and fantastic can be built uh, at the interface of the two fields. So that was the idea. And I think it was overall fun during the transition. That's really great because as an engineer, you have to deal with physics and mathematics and now as a uh, neuroscientist, you have to deal with the brain, uh, functioning of brain yeah. and you have to combine both the things. That's really yeah. a challenging thing and really interesting to explore the uh, what is inside our brain. Yeah, I do not know whether there was one moment kind of thing. Uh, so I loved doing research, as I said, I didn't like. Uh, classes like classrooms or say exams as per se uh, okay. science has had been fascinating all over uh, through school I was fascinated by science and the research I think um, what motivated me towards uh, doing research was the fact that uh, you know when you are thinking about a problem which is not known and yes. if you have that moment when you Something which you are, we were not able to understand before, but you come up with a solution or you come up with an idea to solve that problem. And, or even a simple equation, suppose you are not able to derive or figure out the meaning of it. And if you think deeper into it, you are able to figure it out. Yes. So as that, as the mysteries unfold, that joy that you get, and when you are not understanding something, but you are able to understand after some thinking, I think uh, that was kind of something very attractive for me. And uh, yeah, I never liked nine to five jobs. So <laughs> I had decided early on that industry job was not for me. Yeah, I did a couple yeah. of uh, internships and figured that out. Mm -hmm. And I also didn't want a boss over my head to tell me what to do. Uh, okay. So I realized, mm -hmm. uh, you know, um, like a faculty position would be ideal because you would can do independent yes. research and yeah, you can build your own lab and drive the research as you want. Uh, so I think those were kind of the motivation. Yeah, probably not really. So I had very like strong likes and dislikes. Uh, so kind of, as I said, like I hated biology and I loved no, physics. Uh -huh. And uh, I also wanted to not just understand, but also ch able to be, you know, change, able to change things as well. So I think engineering was kind of obvious choice for me. And yeah, I mean, though, during the, uh, you know, the course of time, I have moved more towards biology. And so, so yeah, I didn't have any conflict when I decided that I would do engineering. Okay. And then for PhD was along the same line. Uh, when I was deciding what to do for a postdoc, so I had decided that I'm going to diversify. Uh, so okay. that was kind of, um, I had decided because I wanted to learn a different field. And then I was thinking I would do either more, uh, like go more towards physics. With, and I was thinking about spintronics, is that, um, going into the area of spintronics and learning more about that. And another area I was thinking of was uh, neuroscience, um, just because I got interested in the brain. Okay. And then 
uh, what happened was I was talking to different uh, professors in both these regions, basically neuroscience and spintronics. And uh, when I talked to uh, my current advisor, it seemed like a perfect match. He also seemed very enthusiastic and open to like new ideas. And so I thought, okay, this is a good match for me. And this is, I mean, uh, this would be a good opportunity to learn about the brain as well. Uh, so yeah, that's how I landed up in neuroscience. Kind of. So I would actually have to start from electronics. So where does it come from? So uh, like if we think about our computer today, like everyone uses a computer and we yes. all know that you know, if it, after working for some time, the computer or laptop just starts to generate a lot of heat. Yes. And the reason we cannot make our uh, computer more efficient and do computation more uh, like faster why each of our laptop is not a supercomputer by itself oh. it's the uh, heat generation so that's the major problem that if we want to have the capabilities of a supercomputer in the form of a laptop it will basically generate so much heat yes and that it, it will just burn our like we cannot hold it with our hand and uh, the heat generated will basically melt all the metal interconnects and all the devices the uh, transistors, which are the switches in the computers, cannot basically resist that heat. Uh, so my PhD work basically had been to lower this heat generation and develop uh, extremely low power computers. And as I said that the reason I got interested in the brain is because you can think of brain low as a low computer. So when the brain works, it takes about uh, 20 watts of power, which is uh, similar to a mere yeah. light bulb. You know, light bulb. Low power. Yeah. Okay. And the same computations, if the brain does, it will take about a million times. Uh, sorry, if the same computation, if a conventional computer does, if oh. we say, have a, if we have, if we build a computer which will equal, equal to, in, in you know, which can equal the brain in its computational ability, it will take about a million times more power. Okay. So that means, you know, Mother Nature has built this brain in such a way, such an intricate way, that it's able to handle this much computation, but mm. low power. Very low power, you know. Something. But right now we understand very less about the brain. Like we have, we have almost uh, like very, very less knowledge as to how the brain works. And so one way to understand the brain and would be to, if we want to understand, if you want to know the biomolecular structure and also how this structure leads to functionality of the brain. Okay. And if we can record the activity of the brain, like uh, each of the computational elements in the brain is called a neuron. And yes. if we can measure the activity of the neurons, uh, with high precision, right? Okay. Then it will tell us, uh, you know, cues, clues about, you know, the neuronal information coding. So, but there are, in our brain, there are like, uh, you know, 100 billion neurons. It is okay. very difficult to measure this activity at a single neuron level, but also 100 billion neurons at the same time. So the idea is, can we really build uh, low-power electronics, uh, which will be able to, say, record and sense this uh, activity of neurons? And they can be of the size of the neuron, which is few microns in size, but low-power enough uh, that they do not burn the brain tissue. Yeah, that's important. So, so that's how this uh, low power electronics, which uh, which we were thinking initially to lower the power of computers, can actually yeah. help us to also understand the brain. So and okay. then later on, the idea is that when we have a better understanding of the better understanding of the brain, we can 
take take up some of the principles of brain computation and incorporate them to the electronics as well. There is a synergistic relationship. So you can use the electronics to understand the brain and the understanding of the brain can help to build Love. better. Okay, so you are replicating the functioning of brain in uh, to our daily in daily life of electronics. Yeah, at present, no. At present, the idea is to understand the brain better. Okay. So now I'm trying to develop electronics, uh, which will be of the size of the neurons. Like we are planning to build nano computers, which can either um, sit on the surface of the cell. Or can oh. go inside a cell like a neuron and measure its uh, activity. Like there are potential changes in the neurons when the neurons, you know, want to talk to another neuron. Mm -hmm. So the idea is uh, to measure those activity of neurons at a single neuron level, but also at a large scale. Like, in general, like ideally, you would like to measure millions and billions of neurons at the same time. I think it's a really challenging and uh, very surprising and amazing field and a lot of things has to explore in this field because two neurons are communicating with each other with the uh, low computing uh, nano, nano computer inside them. always and at every step of, of life, life right i mean i don't know what is the biggest failure but uh, i mean there were failures coming all the way around so i so i never did very well in any major exams so as to say either uh, the board exams or the competitive exams I, I mean i did kind of okay i did not do as much as i worked uh, okay. i would say so i was not very happy with the outcome of those, so that was kind of uh, with the <laughs> um, so, but I'm not sure if that is a failure because that didn't really affect. I mean, nothing kind of affects in the long term if you keep on going. Maybe those affected at that point of time, like there were local failures and there were local depressions, then local in time. Uh, but if you go on and work, uh, you know, work on whatever you like and put your efforts on it, uh, okay. you, you will be eventually, uh, you know, success. you will be eventually successful in whatever you want to achieve. That's what I feel. So even now, if a paper does not get accepted or get bad reviews or proposal gets rejected, those are some kind of depression huh? yeah and before probably if you don't do well in exams that looked like a failure so yeah i think the failures are there part all of success the, yeah it's just a part of success i probably did not have like a major uh, really bad failure bad failure is basically defined as something which is totally which has totally devastated you emotionally that you cannot stand up again. That's a bad failure. Yes. Uh, and, uh, the failure magnitude is probably not defined by in terms of the physical means, like how bad you did in the exam or even if someone failed in an exam, that's probably not a failure as long as that person can stand up again and, you know, work and, mm -hmm. and get some done so that's probably not a failure so i think emotional failure emotional failure is probably the greatest failure if failure you yes it was you so much that a uh, person cannot uh, stand up again and work hmm. otherwise if someone can just you know pull themselves work uh, pull themselves together and start working then probably no failure is a failure Yeah, it's difficult to say what is because uh, mm -hmm. I think maybe uh, the first uh, first we should try to do what we love, and if circumstances turns out that we are not able to do that, because many people may not be able to do that, right? Yeah. There can be 
can give many examples that probably then maybe it is better try to you know love what you are doing or maybe have a side thing even if the main job is something you cannot love can you have a hobby or can you do something you know at the side maybe the thing that you love may not be the one that is uh, earning you money yeah but you can work as a side do something else which you really like i mean even i stand had to work in the patent office i mean that's not what he was meant for right he had to just read patents yes. uh, but he was for doing research so not uh, not that uh, you will get the job always yeah that you uh, that that is who you earn the money but uh, that might not be your bread but you could still try to find a and uh, find something out on the side you can still do something that you know even if that's not you know giving you the money i mean i stand yeah, when you mm-hmm. talk this he was basically uh, it was not that he was only evaluating the patents he was also on the side you know reading mm-hmm. research papers and uh, writing his own theoretical yeah. papers on papers on the side though oh. he was not a researcher and uh, he was not a professor at an university Still, uh, his his job was only to evaluate the patents but he was uh, doing what he really loved so i think you can always find a way to uh, do what you love even if it's not at a large scale even if it's not your main profession or even if it's not what is earning you your, your bread uh, but you can find a way to do what you love in the world you should ask this question <laughs> yeah i do not know i have three lives i probably has have, have just one life i think my love life professional life research life on life is same yeah i think i love my work and it's kind of the only life that i have oh. yeah i do i have my family in india and i go back every once a year or so and that's when i only have my family life and okay i do they're doing that time when i'm there uh, so i'm just leading one life at a time so <laughs> i mean i'm just a family i'm leading a family life and most of the time when i'm not talking over phone with my parents or my family i am probably i uh, just i'm not sure it's called professional because professional life because this is also my love life because that's what i really love to do so it's not just a professional or job oh. that i so i really like so i would say i'm one of those lucky persons who got to do the job that also i yeah, really like. like so i think is uh, is it that your uh, secret of success that you are getting the job that you love yeah i think that that could be the secret of success because if you uh, really do the job which you also really love then you know you enjoy doing what you like so that definitely helps you to go forward i mean there are always ups and downs you don't get it very easily of course yes. you'll have to struggle in the beginning to get what you want uh, but if you get that of course then life uh, becomes like heaven and <laughs> I don't think the goal in life was to become a professor at MIT. I would say the yeah, average people would like to be known by the institute. Good people would like that. You know, good people for good people who are really great, uh, the institutes are known by them, right? Uh, yes. So I think the um I think the goal is always to do, you know, great research and okay. something which uh, can be helpful for the humanity. something which can create new knowledge okay. and i think those are the goals uh, at a very broad scale and then of course if you it boils it down to the specific research uh, what kind of impact that can have in understanding the brain and in say uh, developing low power electronic computations so those are okay. like god's uh, small details of it and what about nobel prize ma'am <laughs> <laughs> yeah nobel prize Yeah, I cannot say that as a aim or a goal. You can, I mean, Nobel Prize is 
it also depends on a lot of things uh, like uh, so there are many good researchers who are whose work is impactful but who have not won Nobel prizes and also it's the other way around um, uh, so yeah I don't think of it as a goal yeah oh. yeah weakness is the you know the lack of research uh, like resources the lack of uh, infrastructure uh, you know lab lab space and the quality of labs so okay. i think if more uh, funds can be spent in mm -hmm. i think it has improved a lot compared to say what was there 10 years ago mm, yes, yes. I think, um, yeah, many institutes i would say uh, in some areas Specifically in computation, where you don't need many experimental resources, India is really doing very well. Yes. But in experimental sciences, where I think more uh, funding is required to build labs yes. and uh, infrastructure, there I think India is lacking behind. Okay. So I think the government can spend more money in developing the labs. Uh, that would also retain some of retain the good students and good people back in India. And, uh, you know, researchers, researchers from all over the world would also like to go back to India if the research facilities, experimental facilities are good to work in, right? What, what about you, ma'am? If, if infrastructure is available, then will you come back to India for research? Yeah, yeah, of course. Why not? Oh, I can see really in India great. and have Indian food and family <laughs> would be near. So, yeah, yeah. Think, are you missing there? Indian food and... Uh, Family, of course, family, but what about Indian food? I think it is easy yeah, to yeah. in the USA. Yeah, I'm missing. So whenever I go to India, actually, that's my schedule. <laughs> like, <laughs> to eat all the Indian snacks. And uh, so my family actually prepares for from a month uh, before I come. Like, okay, what is your favorite one, ma'am? What is your favorite snacks or in a sweet? Oh, snacks? <laughs> Like, so I eat a lot of Golgappa when I go to India. <laughs> so there's yeah. a special snack person whom my father calls when I'm there. So he will come near our house to sell that, specifically during the time mm -hmm. when I'm there. Oh. And yeah, all sorts of Indian food, basically. I mean, yeah, Bengalis eat a lot of fish. Uh, okay. So that is there. I'm also a big fan of South Indian food, actually. Oh. Uh, dosa and, Italy, yeah, dosa. Italy. <laughs> yeah, that I like. So, yeah, almost I would say almost everything. Oh. In weeks and I eat for the whole year. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, nice. And uh, what about the strength of India? Oh, as I said, in terms of theoretical research, I think uh, India is doing very well uh, when it comes to something where you can derive something theoretically and you do not need experimental resources. And I think yeah. Indian students are very strong in, uh, say, mathematics and basic uh, science, yeah. fundamental science subjects. Uh, so uh, I think that's something. I think our educational system, yeah, I don't really like it because it, it kind of puts a lot of pressure yes, on yeah. the students in the beginning so yes. it doesn't give room for innovation it's like you have to learn by heart a lot of things yes. but at the same time i think the maths uh the math mathematics specifically is kind of uh, strong okay. in indian curriculum compared to many other countries yes uh, so that makes the students uh, kind of good in maths and science if i think the Learning by heart component can be taken out, and if we can have uh, some innovative ways instead of you know making, uh, especially very small kids, they have to like learn. Yeah, I think they miss on their uh, childhood. Uh, I think I am like working less than what I used to do as a <laughs> nursery student. You need to like learn so many rhymes and. Uh, yeah, so I know a few kids who have to, like, three and four years old, and they have to, la uh, like, write from A to Z and write ten words for each, each letter. <laughs> I said, what is this? This is, like, torture. And this is, 
like uh, like two full pages where you just there's just A B C is written and you just have to uh, you know draw on top of whatever is written. I said I will not do it if someone tells me to do it and you are expecting a four year child to do that. And that's their homework every day. You know, every right? Every day. Let's really pressure, ma'am. Let's really pressure for a small children. This is just going to kill their, uh, you know, curiosity, Thinking. and would uh, they would also not be excited about education because this mm-hmm. is not exciting, right? If we just correct, have correct. to write mm-hmm. two pages of the same thing. Yeah, that I think so we have to work on. of the things here are better i think the kindergarten they don't mm-hmm. really put a lot of pressure on very small okay so they are basically learning by playing uh so i think uh, uh, yeah so that is really good because mm-hmm. yeah too much pressure on the childhood if they if they don't Danger. enjoy education mm-hmm. uh, uh then you know they are not going to love it yeah you will they, they will just fear or you know hate that Yeah. yeah i think the role of guide is important but then the student can be as good as he is by himself so the guide or uh, you know the guide or advisor cannot change the person fundamentally mm-hmm. i think the advisor is not really like a guru as you think of it in indian sense yeah. is going to huh. spiritually transform you <laughs> so he's not he's not going to spiritually transform transform someone so so i cannot convert like a lazy person who is demotivated into like mm-hmm. a highly motivated great scientist uh, so the idea is that uh, you know to take students who are motivated and enthusiastic and are willing to learn Okay. but try to channelize their energy and tell them uh, you know to guide them in terms of what kind of research is going to be more impactful and uh, to encourage them when the results are not looking good and they look depressed and telling them say even a negative result is still a good and worth looking into so it is more of how you can channelize their energy and if they are uh, you know uh, to tell them which which research projects i don't know because you okay. have more experience than the students than those with those of whom who will be coming uh, so give them research projects and discuss with them and help them you know transform into independent researchers uh, so that i would say is the role of uh, of an advisor so yeah it's not so much as a you can always lift them up when they are demotivated mm-hmm. uh, because uh, an advisor has uh, more experience and uh, you know more knowledge or understanding of the research field yeah. so if there are mm-hmm. two project uh, which one of them uh, like can guide like your future projection of you know this project if you do and this is going to be a result probably even if it is negative versus positive was the impact that is going to make on the field yes help our students decide and it also depends on um, you know it's a students to student uh, based uh, because some students are very independent to start with and uh, some students need more help not that they are uh, not good so intellectually they might be very good so they might be if you give them a problem they may be able to think about you know how to solve it so that an advisor can uh, help there and come in and you know provide their inputs the first thing that you should do or anyone should, when they have an idea is to uh do a back of the envelope calculation like a very rough calculation to see that if it makes sense and if there are some very fundamental limitations which uh, you know come in the process like it and you know, if coming in the way of say, thermodynamics it can it can never be done or you need basically mm-hmm. sometimes practical limitations get it done you need just huge amount of money so people would rather use a cheaper process than you know even if uh, the results are a little bit better 
Uh, so you'll have to kind of do some calculations in terms of, you know, what are the outputs that you are thinking that this uh, idea would give. And when you calculate how much you are actually getting and are there some limitations in terms of uh, whatever, it depends on the idea, idea that can be done or not at all. Sometimes yeah. you will feel that you are thinking of the idea and uh, when you actually do the calculations, figure out oh, it's just not going to work. If you have availability of experimental tools, try out uh, like as simple version of that as possible. Uh, to figure out, you know, some, uh, some, if not the whole thing, some uh, initial steps towards that uh, idea, whether the small steps work out experimentally. And if it works out experimentally, uh, probably it's not going to be the same result that you got from your back of the envelope calculations if there is a mismatch trying to understand why that is coming from. It could be better or it could be worse, right? The result. But you still you still need to understand those theoretically, and then you build up on that. You know, try to go towards more complex um, experiments. So trying to, uh, what I should say is like breaking down. Uh, you know, uh, that final outcome. Okay. It's as simple as possible experiments, and first of all, theoretical results uh, that you can build towards that project. Sometimes okay. you learn a lot along the way and uh, sometimes what happens most of the times actually it happens that uh, what you learn along the way and what you try to do along the way turns out to be more important yes. than the final previous idea that you were thinking of In a very broad sense, I think what is more important is identifying the problem. Non-impactful research is when the problem itself is not important, what someone is focusing on. So someone is trying to solve a problem which no one cares about and which is not important at all. Mm. So identifying the problem is very important. When you solve, it's going to have an impact. I think that's what research that impactful uh, that's what it does. It solves a problem, major problem, which is affecting the society, right? And then you will have to have strong base in the fundamentals of, you know, whatever you are, whatever research area. Fine. Good schools have uh, good resources. So, as I said, when you come up with the idea, you are able to quickly, you know, implement those because uh, of the presence of resources. Yeah. Some of the things I think we kind of discussed along the way that you're, you know, loving your research versus, or loving what you, loving your job already or, you know, do what you love. Uh, yeah. uh, so, so I think we discussed that, you know, try yes, to yes. do what you love first and then if that does not turn up, uh, you can always do that as a side thing, even if it is not your main profession. That's one I think second thing I would say is um, uh, getting out of the comfort zone and looking beyond. Uh, so sometimes we are kind of, uh, say, doing research in one field and we get comfortable there that we know this one well. Uh, but often if we are, um, you know, if we keep our eyes open beyond and try to uh, also read uh, papers and read the researchers research that is going on in say tangential fields uh, that's not only interesting and it will intellectually stimulate yes. person but you may often find problems uh, in which you can apply your knowledge in present research area that you are in and you can apply to a different field and that could be really transformative uh, so I would say yeah, getting out of the comfort Fine. zone yes. is uh, is uh, really uh, important, uh, especially, specifically in research. Mm -hmm.